Hey everybody, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, in this video, in this stream, what I'm going to be talking about is Pendragon. I'm going to be talking about why I love Pendragon as a solo RPG so much. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I play it solo. And then I'm going to finish the video with how my game is going in my solo Pendragon great Pendragon campaign. So that's what this is all about. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump in and get started. So we're going to start with Pendragon. What is Pendragon? Pendragon is all about playing uh, an Arthurian knight. The, the game is based around playing a knight during King Arthur times. In fact, King Arthur is in the game. His father, King Uther, I think, is in the game. I should know that. I've been playing for uh, a few years now. Um, and the, uh, the game mechanics really support this um, King Arthur style of play, this knightly style of play. I have the character sheet here on the big screen. It's got some basic stuff in it. Uh, if you play Dungeons and Dragons or other fantasy RPGs, a lot of this is going to seem similar to what you uh, might already be doing. Like you can see strength, dexterity there on the screen, constitution, but there's some other statistics that are a little bit different, like size and appearance, and those actually make a big difference in, in a few different things. Uh, the cool thing about um, Pendragon, one of, the, one of the many cool things, is that combat's a little bit different, how damage is applied a little bit different, and it makes combat less complex um, in some ways, more complex in other ways. Um, in my mind, I think of it as linear because there's less options during combat, but uh, I still think it's quite fun. But the, the point is that the, these changes, when you compare Dungeons & Dragons to Pendragon, really make this a, um, a, a great game for solo play. Um, now, uh, I, I'm going to kind of, well, I, I, I threw the stream together uh, last minute here because my my Dungeons and Dragons group had to cancel tonight. Uh, there were, we didn't have enough people, um, so I don't have my regular setup. So the character sheet, as you can see, is kind of curling up towards my camera stand, which happens to be an RPG book, um, Alien the RPG. So that's that's why it's looking like this. But uh, one of the reasons why Pendragon, going back to the design of it, is such a good, so good for solo play, is because of this box right here: the personality traits, and then further down, the passions. Now, personality traits and passions are essentially how your character feels in these different areas. And you'll notice that there is, for example, pious and uh, worldly or prudent and reckless going across the, the, the screen there. This is a spectrum. So if your character is not very pious, that means they are quite worldly. Or if your character is very prudent, that means they are not very reckless. Uh, there's going to be two values on either side of that little slash there, and those values are going to add up to 20. And so essentially what this does is in any given situation, you can apply a personality trait to the situation and then make a role and have that role determine how your character is going to react in that situation. And so this makes solo play very, very easy uh, when you look at the game from uh, a solo RPG perspective. Same thing with passions down here. You're going to have passions uh, like loyalty or love of family. Um, you're also going to have passions around hatred, like hate of Saxons is one that most characters start out with. And rolling on those passions can also give, uh, kind of lead your character's um, decisions and actions in a certain direction. So the mechanics of this game really lend itself to, uh, number one, a very well-designed game in my opinion and number two uh, excellent excellent solo play um, I, I think this entire game is just extremely well designed um, I, I love all of it uh, there is uh, most of it I should say there are um, feet I mean there's feasts. Feasts are in like a, a part of the game that is mechanical, and there's cool things that happen during feasts, and they're a lot of fun to play even solo. I think feasts would be more fun with other people, but they're still very fun to play solo. Um, they're in, built into the game are mechanics around your family tree, around estate building, around the storyline, especially when you get into the Great Pendragon campaign, and even combat works really well solo. It's, there's way less options when you compare it to regular Dungeons and Dragons. Like I said, I think of it kind of as linear because once the battle starts, there's not many choices your character gets as far as like how they're going to attack. It's relatively simple. Um, there's a lot of latitude in what they want to do during their turn, like any role-playing game. But combat is very simple to run solo as well, especially when you consider enemy attacks and things like that because there's not much that an enemy is going to do um, besides, you know, attack or run away or things like that. And so this all kind of wraps up into a really, really nicely designed game. <laughs> Sorry, I just got a text. I'll, I'll close that out here. Um, there is one thing I want to talk about before we move on to the, what, what the Great Pendragon campaign is, which I think is an essential part if you're going to play Pendragon. And it's the fact that 
the um, Pendragon, the RPG, is built around the King Arthur literature that has been written over the last 500 years. And it's incredibly, like I said, it's incredibly well designed. There's an article I read, who's the author, I think, by David Larkins, who got his hands on or currently is in charge of um, the the designer of Pendragon's original notes. And you can go through and um, see the notes he wrote in these old King Arthur uh, books, novels, where he's talking about um, game mechanics that are drawn directly from the text. And it's really, really cool to, to read that article and kind of look at that stuff. Um, but the game is, is very, very narrow. Uh, and it's important to understand that going in. In fact, it's so narrow that it, you need to go into the game understanding that you're going to be playing a knight who wants to uphold their... Um, their honor within the game and earn glory those are kind of the two values that matter most to a knight and glory is kind of like experience and honor is kind of like um something you lose uh, if you lose too much of it you lose the game um uh, you don't lose the game but you lose the character because they are dishonored um and so you have to understand that going in this is not a game where your character can do anything they want your game your character probably won't be doing magic that's not a good idea in this game your character will want to uphold knightly virtues you know, there's some latitude based on the culture that your character is from in the game uh, as to what knightly virtues should be upheld. But in general, there's a very narrow um, type of character you're going to be playing. You're going to be playing a knight. And the knight who's, who's um, values honor and glory uh, above other things. Uh, and so that is important to know going in. You know, this is not a game you're going to go thieving off in the night because the game is not built for that. So if you know what this game is and you go in with your eyes open, uh, expecting a, a, a fun game where you're focusing on being a, a knight during King Arthur times. You're going to have a lot of fun. If you go in looking for a sandbox where you can do whatever you want, um, the game's not built for that, so it's just not going to work. There's one other thing that I need to mention. It's important, especially since I want to bring this to my gaming groups. Um, women characters in the game are kind of um, well, they're just not focused on that much. Uh, like I said, the game is designed around King Arthur's knights. In those tales, most knights are men. In history, uh, most knights are men. And so the game is definitely built where your character is likely to be a male knight. Now, there are the, the game book does suggest ways around this, and there's kind of three different levels of, of running ways around this, and um, I'll tell you which one's my favorite. The first way to um, get around this is there, there are lady player character sheets, and these um, would be like important characters in the story, but usually they don't have fighting stats, but there's a, you know that's okay because there's a whole lot of other things to do in this game besides fighting. Um, but this is my least favorite way uh, to do it. Like if you want to play a lady character in the game, um, you're kind of stuck to playing some sort of lady uh, non-knight character. And it just doesn't seem as fun. Knights get to do more stuff in the game. And so I don't like that way uh, to go about it. Uh, the other two ways that the, the book suggests are much more interesting and fun in my opinion. The second way the book suggests to get lady characters into the game is to have, uh, you know, have a lady knight if you want, but have the lady knight try and hide their gender because in this time period, especially when you look at the King Arthur novels and even some historical situations, uh, you know, women weren't supposed to be knights. And so there are some really fun and exciting and um, maybe inspirational stories that can come from, uh, you know, a Joan of Arc type character where uh, a lady's pretending to be a knight and then it's eventually found out that this knight who everybody thought was a man is actually a woman um and you know y there's a lot of really fun storylines you can do there the last option is probably one i would lean towards the most if i was going to run this with my groups and it's just say you know if you want to play uh the gender of your character doesn't matter a knight is a knight and no matter um, what gender your knight is, uh, the game is mechanically going to work the same. So if you're a male knight, that's just fine. Um, if you're a female knight, that's just fine. There's no mechanical difference. There's no, um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of readjust the laws in the game to make um, those things kind of work. And then like childbirth, if a, if a lady knight, you know, gives childbirth, that's not going to mechanically do anything different for their character for, for the next year, you know, whatever. We'll just kind of hand wave some of that stuff. So um, that might be my version just to kind of open the doors a little bit and maybe uh, have our own little slight edge uh, or difference on some of the King Arthur literature. But please know that going in, uh, number one, the game is very narrow in the scope of type of character you're going to play. And of course, because it's based on this, excuse me, original King Arthur literature, the, you know, there, there's just lady characters are not 
knights in that literature and so the game follows that design and says well ladies can be knights but that's kind of not the focus so just just know that going in you can kind of draw your own conclusions and uh, run the game how you want but i think that's important to say out front now, having all said that, I, I really do like Pendragon. I think it's, like I said, an incredibly well-designed game. I think that the, um, like I said, the, the mechanics work very, very well for the type of game it is trying to be, and they lend themselves really, really well towards solo play. So now let's get into a little bit about solo play. The first thing that I did when I decided I was going to run this game solo is I figured out what type of adventure or campaign I could run. And very, very quickly, I found a resource called The Great Pendragon Campaign. This is an absolutely incredible book, very, very innovative. Um, basically, it is a big book where every single... Um, Every single like adventure within the book is one year of time. And so over time, and we're talking like 80 years or something like that, I think, um, your character is going to have all these adventures, probably eventually die or retire or get old. And then somebody else in your family tree will become a character and then continue that storyline of your family throughout this epic adventure telling the full story of King Arthur from his father, King Uther, all the way down the line to uh, you know Merlin shenanigans and King Arthur coming back and reuniting Britain and um, stuff with fairies and oh it's 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 absolutely incredible it's really really well set up and again it is absolutely um, easy it is easy to run as a solo RPG now I'm gonna move the character sheet out of the way here we might come back to that <clears throat> and I'm going to show you uh, I mean I, I could show you the well I I'm not going to show you the whole, whole entirety of the great pendragon campaign but i'm going to show you parts of it um let's get this zoomed in here come on camera all right there's a picture um and we're going to move forward to uh the beginning of character creation so in pendragon you'll be creating a character and character creation is relatively similar to dungeons and dragons where you're going to be rolling values to tell you like how strong your character is or how tall like the size of your character or um, what your appearance is for for your character and those, of course, impact your stats, how much damage you can do, and things like that. Uh, same thing with your personality traits and with your passions. Um, but one of the cool things that happen with uh, with the game, and uh, specifically this ties into the Great Pendragon campaign, is you are going to roll, make a series of rolls through history that determine your family tree. And this reminds me a lot of how a character in Traveler is set up. And Traveler is another one of my favorite RPGs, especially for solo play. But in Traveler... You're making all these roles to determine your character's history and the different careers they've had. In Pendragon, you're making a series of roles based on all these different years to show what um, what the history of your family, what your family tree is. And so it starts in year 440. Now, I think, if I can look at my notes quick, sorry. I think that the game, yeah, the game starts in 485. So you're going to be making uh, a fair amount of roles here to determine... Um, let's get this zoom back in. Yikes, sorry. Like I said, not a great setup right now. Did this last minute. Come on, camera. Come on. There we go. Uh, you're going to be making a series of rolls to determine um, what your family tree looks like. Like here in year 440, um, it says during this year, King Constantine is murdered by one of his own guards. You're going to roll a d20, and you're going to determine what your uh, great-grandfather, I think it is, um, did during this particular year. And there's all sorts of things that could happen. Uh, and then there's a passion table and you keep track of that and you go to the next one and you go to the next year. And over time, I mean, it just continues. It's very, very cool. Over time, the uh, results of each of these years and these kind of adventures and things and not in re real history, like in King Arthur history that have happened, uh, they develop into a family tree that basically jump starts your character and if you're playing a campaign it jump starts your campaign so i i think it's an absolutely great way to start a campaign um and i absolutely i i said absolutely twice in a row i loved it i absolutely loved said it three times in a row i love the way that it was set up and i think it is so fun for solo play because by the end of that char character creation and family creation you know what your family history is and that tells you a lot about how your family and how your characters are going to react in the future in addition to character and family creation, in addition to the great Pendragon campaign, Pendragon itself is set up well for solo play because it has a whole bunch of workflows that you follow. This, this is great for me because I love taking these, um, these items step by step and figuring out how to, uh, how to roll on different tables and basically using the results to determine how it impacts my family in the game or the character I have in the game. 
Um, and this is one example of these workflows. Every year, uh, this is a free resource actually that I found online. Um, I'm probably going to put a link in the notes at some point where you can find these things. I'm not quite sure when I'll get that up, but uh, that'll be there sometime soon. Um, but this is one thing you might roll uh, every year in the game. So in the Great Pendragon campaign, this would be after the, in the winter phase, so after the um, the adventure for the year. And you roll in the yearly events table. It would just be a D20 right there in the upper left. Uh, and then maybe you roll a uh, an eight. So that's relation. So you go find number 24 here, box number 24, um, which is on the sheet that I didn't print out. Okay, but then you would roll it there and then something would happen to your character and you'd have to figure out how to respond to it or maybe based on your character's personality traits or passions, it would just happen automatically. And when it comes to solo play, I very much am a simulationist, so I love when there are systems in place that determine different aspects of the story and allow my character to react. And that's exactly what this is and that's exactly what Pendragon does is it has these workflows, it has these um, these series of steps that you can follow uh, throughout any given play session, which is usually split down into a year. Um, and it just makes it easier to play solo. You know, you're never directionless in Pendragon, especially when playing the great Pendragon campaign. You always know what's coming next, whether it's... Um, well, I'll, I'll give you an example right now. Uh, the way the... Way the in the Great Pendragon campaign, um, it is set up by year. So the first year you play is 485, I believe, um, AD 485. And um, in the year 485, you start off with uh, a spring court, and then usually there's an adventure in the summer. Your your character is called to um, do some sort of duty for their liege lord, and then that's the main amount of time you're going to be spending playing the game. Um, and it's always it's like a different adventure or a different event or something like that. Um, and so that's where you're actually doing a lot of the role playing. It might be combat, it might be feasts, any of the things I mentioned before. After that, there may be like weddings, there may be other weird events that happen, uh, and then you might get to the winter phase. And the winter phase is basically when your character is back on their estate, and they're taking care of all of the other things that have happened. And that's when these yearly events happen, that's when kin events happen, that's when you determine if family members have been born or um, family members have died or things like that so um and, th and then that's that's the year that's the play year usually for me it takes about one hour to get through one year in the game uh and then you move on to the next year and so it follows that same structure where it's spring court you find out what's happening for the year summer you go on your adventure you you pay homage to your liege lord by offering your service as a knight, yada, yada, yada. You do, you do the role playing. And then uh, after that, you get back into your, your estate and then you do the winter phase. You find out what's been happening at the back end. Um, you can, uh, there, there's, there's latitude to do other things in between, but that's, that's the structure. So you follow the structure year by year by year. You're never lost. You always know what's coming next. And that's why it is great for solo play. Um, so looking at looking at um, the game so far, the Great Pendragon or er, Pendragon is a game that I love, and it's set up really nicely for solo play. Uh, we've covered that. We've covered that. I'm looking at my notes now. Um, oh yeah, I, finally I want to get to how I play. So so the way I kind of set this all up is um, the first thing I did was learn the rules. That did take a while. There's a lot of really uh, finicky rules. Um, a lot of the rules I think uh, make sense until you start to get into um, Maybe there's there's a lot of rules to try and simulate more realism or more heroism in in combat. Maybe um, although combat's super dangerous and super deadly, and so there there is some uh, the rules aren't super tight. They're not, um, but but they they're I think especially in combat. Um, but in general, I think the entire design is very very good. So I basically figured all that out. I have a bunch of cheat sheets and player aids I made myself for the rules. Uh, and then the other thing I did is I put together these workflows. So I have a, I have a sheet that's basically a checklist every single, single winter phase. So I know when the winter comes, I need to, number one, figure out how my estate did. Did we have a high yield from crops? Did we not? Did we had, did anybody raid our estate? You know, I answered all those questions. Um, I figure out about kin events, uh, like family events or yearly events. Um, was anyone born? Did anyone in the family die? You know, those types of things. Um, I go through the estate building. So I go through kind of the, a little bit of the financials of the estate. I figure out, hey, can I make any improvements? Can I buy anything? Do I own any debts? Um, and, you know, I, I made those checklists. And then the last thing that I do is um, I, every single time I play, uh, there's a really great podcast um, that I, I think is great. It's called The Esoteric Order of Role Players. Um, and so what I do is I listen to the episode 
because uh, they, they did a full Great Pendragon campaign. So they start at year 45, which is the first year of the Great Pendragon campaign, and they move forward uh, one year at a time. And so what I do is I listen to um, whatever year is coming up next in the podcast, and then I play my year, and I get to kind of compare and get uh, get game notes from their game master and figure out how he handles different situations. Um, and so that's kind of my workflow. I start with the podcast, listen to that, and then I go uh, play my game. I use these kind of checklists or player aids as I'm playing, um, and then I really try and simulate character actions again using my character's traits and passions, uh, which again is, is I think, excellent, uh, excellent design. Um, so I've talked about Pendragon and why I like it. I've talked a little bit about um, why I think it's great for solo play. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how my game is going. Um, and I, oh boy, this might be tough. This is pencil on paper. And I'm hoping that it's going to show up better than this. You know, what? we can skip this one and go to this one maybe. All right, what happens if I move this? Oh, that's brutal. Give me a second. Sorry. What's going on here, camera? There we go. Come on, focus up. Yikes. Um... Let's try this. Come on, stay. Stay focused. So when I bought this camera... I was talking to the person at the store, I think it was a micro center, and I'm glad I made the decision I did, because I, I do like this camera, um, this webcam, and I said, hey, you know, I'm looking to get a webcam um, for some odd streaming, you know, twice a year, uh, can you make a suggestion? Um, like I said, I like the camera that they gave me, uh, but one of the things I was asking about is whether or not I should get a camera that has autofocus or if I should get a camera that um, has manual focus. And they highly, uh, they really tried to steer me away from the camera with manual focus. And I get it. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense because I use this camera both for streaming uh, like this, where it's pointing down at a table um, to try and focus, uh, and also for streaming, um, like when it's pointing at my face and I'm talking into the camera. So when it's pointing at my face and talking into the camera, I think autofocus makes a lot of sense. But when, uh, I'm doing something like this, uh, I, I kind of wish that I would have gone with a ma uh, manual focus so I could just keep it focused on the tabletop and I wouldn't have to worry about it every once in a while, um, losing focus. Of course, I was also, letting the camera focus on a blank white tabletop, which definitely doesn't help the autofocus um, there. Okay, so here is uh, how I started my game. I started with a uh, family tree, and I'll be removing these sticky notes as I talk about this a little bit. And my, I used the, uh, what I just showed you for um, generating the history of my family and my family tree in the core rule book. So I went through each of these years, I made all the roles and identified what was going on. Uh, and I started with Gregory. Oh, first of all, the family that I uh, ended up playing is a culture of uh, basically a Roman culture. They're a holdover from when it was Roman Britain and then the Romans left because you know they couldn't f funnel enough resources into Britain to hold it. And so my family uh, in the game was one of the families that ended up being left over from that time period. Um, Gregorius was the first knightly type character and Gregorius, it's tough to see on the camera, but he ended up with 3000 glory. So again, glory is kind of like experience. Um, 4000 glory is a benchmark in the game where it's like, wow, you're kind of famous at that point. So Gregorius is well known in his region, but kind of outside of that, um, he was just a good knight. Uh, and so he ended up kind of being that patriarch of the family um, and kind of set that high bar for uh, what it takes to become great within the family. Um, his son was Corpus, and uh, Corpus did not quite live up to Gregorius's um, uh, level of glory. Uh, however, he did live for 53 years, which was quite a long time. Um, and then his son was Avidus. All right, and Avidus had even less glory, so Avidus did not do a good job as far as uh, game terms go. Avidus uh, ended up dying in 479, so that takes place six years before the game starts, and he married Iria, who is still alive in the game. Avidus also had, and it's tough to see here, but illegitimate children over here, Rolo and Carmel. Um, and and uh, there, um, there were uh, 
there's other illegitimate coming as well. But that kind of seems to be a benchmark in this family as well as illegitimate children, uh, at least that we know of through the um, the father's side. So before I kind of get started into what's going on in my game and the history of my game, I do want to say that all of the plot points that you're going to hear were developed within the ga within gameplay. So I was just playing the game and these plot points would come up. And then what I would do is just connect the dots. And that's why I think that this game is great for solo play because, excuse me, because there's so many different plot points. I mean, honestly, when I'm playing this game, it feels like, a, uh, like I'm watching Game of Thrones or I'm reading Game of Thrones or something because there's so many devious plot points that kind of spring up and, and things that happen where if you just connect the dots, all of a sudden it's like, whoa, we have a, a major plot hook or conspiracy on our hands that, you know, would have been tough for me to come up with on myself. So um, the things I'm going to be talking about, all of the plot points were game driven by the mechanics. And then all I did was connect the dots with the story. So very, very easy to play solo. So so this is the family tree. Um, the first character I actually have is Arturius here. And so Arturius... Um, uh, was born in four, um, that's not Artorius, where'd Artorius go? Well, underneath here. Was born in 464, uh, and start, I started playing in year 485, which is the first year of the Great Pendragon campaign. So here is Artorius. This is the old um, character sheet. I went through a few different versions before I settled on whatever the current one is um, as of the recording of this video, which I think is 5th edition. So uh, this is in 485, and the year 485, Artorius is knighted. Um, and the big thing that happened that year after he got knighted was that he got captured. It was like the first battle of of the game, and Arturius gets captured, and the Earl that Arturius is um, alleged to is uh, or um, uh, kind of reports to has to the Earl has to ransom. Arturius back. So Arturius ends up owing the Earl money because the Earl needed to get the knight back. Um, and so all of a sudden there's like this schism. And, and if you look here back at the family tree, um, you know, we have Gregorius here with a lot of glory, Carpus with slightly less, Avidus with even less. So there's kind of this trend of like, oh, each person, each knight in the family is worse and worse and worse. And that's kind of something that Arturius is fighting up against, right? He is, um, he, he needs to be better than Avitus, Otherwise, uh, their family is going to lose standing in their region. Um, and you know they're 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 going to be in trouble. So in 486, uh, something amazing happens to Arturius, and he falls in love with some with with a, a local um, high lady whose name is Lady Adwin, uh, and he tries to court her. Now this is actually a plot point from the Great Pendragon campaign, and I'm actually going to take a quick time out. I do also want to add. I'm going to be covering the Great Pendragon campaign. There's going to be minor spoilers. I'm going to avoid all of the major ones. I'm just going to focus on how the family is doing. And I'm going to try and avoid anything crazy that might happen in the Great Pendragon campaign that you should still experience as a surprise. So if you're thinking of playing the Great, Pen the Great Pendragon campaign in the future, don't worry. I'm not going to spoil, or spoil anything major. So you can listen. No worries. Anyways, this Lady Edwin is in the Great Pendragon campaign, and she has a lot of land. And so um, it would be very difficult for a knight uh, in a family that's been losing standing in the area to gain, not only gain the hand of this woman in marriage, but also have it be like, okay, with the Earl of the of the place and the liege lord and everything. So I made a series of roles. Uh, I started with a romance role, and I went to a... Um, uh, what was the other one? I, where is it? Uh, a courtesy roll and then one other one. And I, I, I swear to you, I rolled three criticals in a row. Um, criticals are not a 20. Criticals are getting the absolute highest number you can on any of your skills. But I rolled three criticals in a row and I said, in a row, and I said, well, that's enough for me to say that Arturius and Lady Adwin and all of her estates are getting married. So all of a sudden in 486, the family's um, their, the tables turn and their luck turns and all of a sudden Lady Adwin and all of her estates and wealth come into the family. All right. And so this is, uh, basically an incredible series of events for the family. Now that winter, um, they have a son. All right. So they have a son and, oh, here's the marriage. There's Adwin. Uh, they have a son and the son's name is Sylvanus. All right. Sylvanus is now the heir to both Lady Adwin and Arturius's fortune. So Arturius has one estate, Lady Adwin has like five, and so he's all of a sudden a very wealthy baby. 
The problem is that Lady Adwin dies in childbirth, but the baby Sylvanus survives. So Sylvanus is very, very, very wealthy, but also very, very, very young. And so now all of a sudden we have a problem because Sylvanus can't uh, is the um, is the person who will eventually in, uh, inherit these estates, but can't control them until uh, he becomes of age. And so uh, this becomes the ma the major plot point for my game so far is can this family hold on to these estates until Sylvanus becomes of age. Um, and that is the, uh, it, it, it's incredible to me that in the second year of playing, like the overarching point of my, my entire story that I'm building here, uh, is already kind of been decided. Um, so with Lady Edwin's death, uh, first of all, Edwin or not Edwin, Arturius, uh, starts having illegitimate children. So he had Tori, um, actually, I think maybe the year before he got married there. Uh, and then, um, yeah, the next year he has uh, Fulton. And then he even has one more, um, but that one dies in childbirth or the year after as well. So uh, following his, in his father foot, father's footsteps the, with, their, with those uh, illegitimate children. There they are on the side here. Anyways, um, Arturius uh, is obviously um, angry and kind of goes mad, which, yes, is a mechanic in the game. You can go mad as a character. Um, so he goes mad with the death of his wife. Um, like I said, has an illegitimate child. The 487, the next year, ends up being a crap year for the family, for Arturius. Arturius is missing half the year. Finally, when he gets back, um, he, you know, the uh, the Earl is pissed because he missed his um, the, the time he needed to spend and, and give his duty as a knight. Um, but they do spend a lot of their money to get most of the debt that they owed the Earl paid off. Um, and the, uh, the main thing here that Arturius tried to do was basically convince the Earl that, Hey, we should be stewards for my son, which is Sylvanus, my, uh, his son's estate until Sylvanus becomes of age. And so that was what they tried to convince the Earl. Um, and, and essentially the Earl says, yeah, whatever, that's fine. Um, you know, you're alive, your son's alive. The, there's no reason the estates would go anywhere else, even though the Earl is kind of pissed at Arturius. Okay. 487 passes. Now we're to year 488. And in 488, uh, Arturius marries Lady Maitane. So Arturius Mady's lady, uh, <laughs> I can't talk, marries Lady Maitane right there. So this is uh, my character sheet for Lady Maitane um, with spoilers on top about her eventual fate. Um, and they give birth to their daughter, Valentina, who is still alive in the story. All right. Then 489 comes and Arturius dies in battle. Uh-oh. So this proves a problem for the family. Because Arturius was um, of, at one point late married to Lady Edwin. Uh, they have Sylvanus, the son. But right now, at this point, since Arturius has died, the only person that controls the uh, Lady Edwin side of the estate, which is like the big part, is Sylvanus. And at this point, he's like three years old or something like that. Um, and so the big question, again, is who is going to be steward of these estates until Sylvanus uh, becomes of age? And um, obviously, this family wants to be the stewards so they can continue making money from it and enjoying the prestige and the, the resources they bring. But Lady Adwin has a brother. And that brother also thinks that they should be stewards of the estate since they were originally Lady Adwin's until Sylvanus comes of age. This, again, is the major conflict going forward. So... This happens frequently, uh, as far as I can tell, in Pendragon, characters die because, guess what, combat is dangerous. And so when a character dies, basically you take a look at your your family tree and you figure out, okay, who can I, um, who can I use as a character next? So I had uh, basically everything you see here at this point was a character. Um, if you look at, I have like a cousin over here, I have a few illegitimate children. But the problem right now with the character or with the family tree is that most of the children, like Cosmo here, um, oh yeah, this uh, this character died at 487 um, from, a, from a family event. So that was a no-go. Um, there's not that many of knightly age. And so Carmel uh, was the one that I ended up going with. So Carmel um, de Idemston was my next character uh and i kind of used some inspiration from a game of thrones here um there's a there's a character called the blackfish uh because he's kind of like a i don't know a rogue or not a rogue like a renegade within the family um and so i called this one black spear because the family's uh symbol on their 
on their um, coat of arms was a spear. And that's, again, from Roman times um, because they were Roman at one point. Um, so anyways, this Carmel uh, is in a tough spot because um, there's two big things happening. Number one, he's just kind of been going around. Um, he's been a house knight for a few different lords, a few different uh, landed knights. Landed knights is the term for a knight with an estate. And so finally, uh, he's called back to his home to kind of become head of the house and try and hold these estates together um, for the next basically 12 years or 13 years until Sylvanus is at least close to age um, to becoming a knight and getting to get his inheritance. Uh, the problem is that Carmel is an illegitimate child, so that's a big deal. And if I move his character sheet, Iria really dislikes all of Avidus's illegitimate children, and there are two. Um, and of course, she dislikes uh, Arturius's illegitimate children, which at one point there were three. And so um, in, in her attempt to keep the family together, to keep these this strong estate package that was brought over by Lady Adwin a few years earlier together, she swallows her hatred for this illegitimate child and asks Carmel to come back to the family and help them along. Carmel... Uh, ends up being independently wealthy as I rolled him. Um, and he ends up, uh, I actually made, this was a big role for me. Uh, I made the love of family role and I ended up succeeding with it. Um, which means that yes, he ended up accepting Iria's help and saying, okay, I'm going to come back to, uh, to the family to run the estate. So in 489, the year 489, Carmel heads to Christmas court with Iria to make their case to the Earl, to maintain stewardship of Lady Edwin's manners until Sylvanus is knighted. Uh, the meeting doesn't go great, all right? In fact, uh, Iria, Lady Iria, is um, barely able to save the meeting, and they strike a deal with the Earl, and they say, if the next year goes well, um, or we'll keep the stewardship for this year, and then we'll revisit the, the menu or the, the issue next year. And so basically, while the Earl didn't have any strong evidence to give stewardship over to Lady Edwin's brother, but he did not like the situation at all. Um, Iria then strikes a deal with Lady Maitain. That was uh, Artorius' second uh, second wife, she's right here, and Iria says, if you stay on with the estate, you can marry Cosmo when Cosmo comes of age. So there's a, there's a lot of arranged marriages here, um, and Maytain then is able to help out with the estate as well. Um, and then Iria tells Carmel and says, we have one year, next year you have to do something and win glory to the family. Well, in 490, the good news is Carmel does exactly that. Uh, in bat, in this giant battle, he ends up leading an attack on the uh, king's bodyguard of the, the enemy that they're fighting. Um, and he doesn't quite get through, but he's rewarded for his courage in battle because not many other people who had the chance were willing to do that. So at Christmas court, um, that at the end of the year that year, not only does he repay the rest of the family's debt because he's independently wealthy, but he also just makes a gift. He gives the gift of, to the Earl of uh, quite a bit of money. Um, that, in addition to the courage that Carmel showed during the battle, um, really means that the Earl is very happy with uh, with um, the, the family maintaining stewardship of these estates until Sylvanus is of age. Okay, so the problem is solved for the moment with um, who's going to be taking care of these estates until this young Sylvanus is going to become of age. Uh, the Earl also blesses the, the marriage between Lady Maintain and Cosmo for the future. Okay. Um, also at this time, I should note at 490, Cosmo, I'm sorry, Caramel now has more glory than uh, Artorius. So at this point, Artorius is, uh, I think Artorius ended with the third most glory uh, out of anybody in the family up to that point. So now Carmel has the third most glory, actually second most glory out of anybody in the family up to that point. So into 491, um, Carmel falls for a woman uh, whose name also happens to be Adwin, but it's halfway across uh, England, um, completely unrelated. Guess what? The Adwin has a brother. The brother does not like the fact that an illegitimate child um, is trying to marry his sister, so they're challenged to a duel. Carmel loses, almost dies, almost loses a leg. A lot of bad things happen, barely gets saved. Um, and 491 was a bummer of a year for him. Then in 492, things can continue to go worse, and he actually gets into legal trouble. Yes, legal trouble is something that can happen in this game. Um, he is able to get out of it, uh, but, um, you know, the the... the benefits and the glory gained in the year 490 uh, are not as you know it's it things have taken a turn for the worse over the last two years um and it's it does not look in as good for him as it was two years ago also this year this cousin salvatorix has an illegitimate child right here um whose name is angela 
And uh, Salvatorix, there's a fly, excuse me. Salvatorix asked Carmel to claim the illegitimate child, but Carmel said, you know what? It's important for a father to have a relationship with their child because guess what? Um, Avidus had a relationship with me. Um, and so that was kind of the genesis of uh, that whole conversation. Again, all of these things are happening in the game, which, I, which is why I love this game so much. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just connecting the dots. All of these plot points are actually happening. Uh, these are all determined within the game. So anyways, why I love it. Uh, let's continue. It is now 493 and um, Carmel saves the Earl in an ambush. So all of the bad things that have happened in the last two years are kind of wiped off. Um, Carmel saved the Earl specifically. Um, and guess what the Earl says? Well, uh, Carmel, you've done your job. You are now, um, uh, Cosmo is now of age to become a knight. And so the Earl grants Cosmo stewardship of the manners that Lady Adwin years ago brought to the family uh, which means Sylvanus is the um, the uh, the lone heir too. Now, at this point, I want to make a point that um, each year, one of the things you do is you roll for family survival, and uh, usually, you know, you just look at your family tree, make rolls for everybody, and you know, you just go through. And sometimes people die, but oftentimes they survive. Uh, this was really fun because if Sylvanus died at any point, all of Lady Edwin's stuff would be gone, and that would be a huge devastation for the family. So there was a lot of fun tension in these rolls as I got to Sylvanus to see if Sylvanus could survive uh, the infantile years, um, and and then of course childhood, um, and those things seemed to go up. All right, so I basically retired Carmel at this point. Uh, it's 493 um, because Carmel had done their job and uh, Cosmo had, uh, it was Cosmo's turn to kind of take over the family. But I do want to point out that Carmel ended up with over 3,000 glory, which means that made Carmel the best knight out of the entire family of all time. So when you think about the, the family and how their glory was going down, down, down over the generations, um, Carmel was actually the one who ended up restoring it. And it was kind of this, uh, this fun little bright moment in the story that I was making um, with what was going on. But here's Cosmo. Uh, Cosmo ended up taking over in 494. He immediately gets married to Lady Maytane, uh, and he gets knighted as well. Unfortunately, Lady Maytane uh, dies in childbirth. Um, they do end up having a child, Dwinin. Dwinwin, excuse me, Dwinwin, uh, but uh, Maytane is dead in childbirth, and um, you know it's it's unfortunate. Um, in 495, Cosmo goes to meet the Earl. It's a great meeting. Um, the stewardship is great. The Earl completely lets Cosmo know that hey, there are no issues. The you have the estates until Sylvanus is of age. It's fine. That same year, um, Cosmo does absolutely amazing in a huge, huge battle. Um, and he, he ends up, uh, at the end of that year, the second year he's a knight with more glory than Carmel. So now all of a sudden, the family has a new shining star in Cosmo. And um, <clears throat> he, uh, let's see here, I missed something. Um, yeah, yeah, he comes back a hero. Unfortunately, what happens that year is uh, through some circumstance stuff through the game, uh, quite a few people die uh, from the region. And so Cosmo is actually one of the few people to come back that year from the area. Um, and he comes back an absolute hero. And he marries a uh, Lady Leary. Um, he marries a, uh, a widow um, from that year. Uh, someone who's very recently widowed um, through the story. And so uh, Cosmo is like at the top of the world, even though there's um, uh, maybe a lot of sorrow in the area at the time. The next year, not a lot happens uh, with Cosmo, um, nothing really of note. Then in 497, he makes a fool of himself at court. Uh, he catches some thieves on his land, and he, like, overpunishes them. Um, he ends up being uh, vengeful. If you look at um, forgiving and vengeful, he ends up rolling pretty strongly on the vengeful trait. Um, and not only does he punish the thieves pretty strongly, but he finds out that Lady Adwin's brother actually sent those thieves. So all the way back to Lady Adwin, Lady Adwin's brother is finally striking out um, you know, in actual iron and steel and trying to steal from these lands. Uh, and Cosmo is not happy about that. He ends up raiding another, uh, he, he teams up with another family and raids the lands of some rando 
in uh, in an effort to get that knight on his side to raid Lady Edwin's brother the following year. Um, and so that's what happens. In 498, they raid the lands of Edwin's brother. Um, somehow, he even after doing that, he improves his image of court, uh, in court, and he has a kid. And so that kid uh, with Lady Leary, and that kid's name is Promenus, um, I think. I can't read it from here, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And so now the family tree is uh, up to date with where I am in the game, but there's a little bit more going on as we get to 499. In the year 499, Cosmo goes on an adventure and never comes back. He heads off to a nearby forest. The forest is, has rumors of um, you know magical beings and things like that, and he never returns. Again, that's a part of that plot point was written into the mechanics of the game and again that's why i love the game so much that brings us to the year 499 all right so in the year 499 um there is uh there's a lot of chaos going on in the region at this point the um the earl has died the duchess is the person leading and a lot of the knights um cosmo at this point included are either dead or missing um and the family at this point really doesn't have anybody carmel had died earlier um rollo died uh, very early uh cosmo's missing and really the only uh the only person left is salvatorix Salvatorix is actually on a quest, though. And so there was really no one left in the family. And so Iria went to the Duchess and said, can we get Sylvanus knighted early? And the Duchess, because things are in such bad position in the region, says yes, because they need, no, need more knights. And so um, Sylvanus uh, becomes a knight. But it's with the stipulation that um, I misspoke. Sylvanus is allowed to become uh, to recognize the inheritance of those estates. And so they do become Sylvanuses, but Sylvanus cannot become a knight until the year 501. I just uh, made those determinations through some roles. So what does Sylvanus do over the next two years between 499 and 501? Well, Sylvanus just starts going on adventures. He doesn't have to go and um, pledge his allegiance to the Duchess or give his um, give his uh, his um, knightly uh, like services um, to any wars or something like that. Uh, and so he just goes on adventures and he grabs one of the household knights in their uh, on their estate and he goes and decides to start on a quest to find his uncle Cosmo. Um, not a lot happens. I mean, I shouldn't say that. A whole bunch happens in the year 500 and 501. Essentially, they're just adventures. It was very fun to play. Um, in the year 501, finally Sylvanus becomes knighted, becomes uh, married, um, and then almost dies immediately after becoming married. Uh, but he, uh, he does survive and um he finally becomes inheritance of the estate and uh and is basically um you know the focal point of this entire story so far has come to fruition sylvanus is um you know he is uh he has the inheritance and he is um the last knight remaining essentially um it was around this time in my game that i realized that i have no other knights in the family tree at this point so if things go poorly, uh, I thought after 501 or in the year 501, and if Sylvanus died or something like that happened, I would just say, okay, you know what, that was a really fun story, but I'm not going to try and rebuild. I'll just stop and then maybe start a new one some other time. Fortunately, in 502, um, oh, one other bad thing happened in 501. Uh, his wife died, Rosamond of childbirth. So fortunately, in 502, a whole bunch of good things happen. Number one, Sylvanus comes back, uh, comes back from the forest and he finds Cosmo. Cosmo was stuck in the clutches of a witch. Sylvanus was able to outwit and eventually kill the witch, and so now the family has two knights again, and two very, very good knights. Um, Cosmo's glory is almost to that 4,000 mark, which, um, there's Cosmo's glory right there, almost to that 4,000 mark, which again is really, really high. That means you're now becoming like a superstar within the area, and people outside the area know of you. Uh, Sylvanus very far behind at this point with only 1750 glory but guess what sylvanus is leader of the family at this point and he has all of the estates with him he also uh happens to marry a uh pretty high uh and noble woman and a wealthy uh noble woman named glessig which of course adds more estates to the family so 502 was a swing in the right direction for the family um they also have a few other knights that are um you know this knight's 
502, 13, oh, 15. So this night's 15, this night's 17. Um, these aren't nights yet, but these are uh, other children. And so they have they have some more people that are going to be coming of age soon uh, into that knighthood style um age and so uh i think that the story is um the, the is looking up for the family so ultimately uh that's that's where i am so far i'm only on year 502 i usually only play four or five years in the game per year in real life just because it's something that i find pretty easy to sit down uh pick pick up put down whenever i want um and yeah i i wanted to go over this because i i'm very excited about it and i think that it uh, like I said before, Pendragon is a really well-designed game, but also it works so well in solo play. And again, I just wanted to highlight everything I just covered with all of the uh, the adventures and the, the the plot points. All of that was derived through in-game mechanics. It wasn't just me like making up a story and making it happen through role-playing. That was me rolling dice on tables um reading the prompts from the great pendragon campaign uh rolling dice on my character sheets for their personality traits uh, and determining what the character's reactions would be and uh those were plot points that were organically derived from the game and i just it's amazing i mean it's just i just told what i think is a very fun story to be engaged in it's a story that i would read it reminds me a lot like i said of game of thrones and it is very um it just feels organic and it's really easy to connect the dots and take these crazy plot points and make it into a fun story. So I'm going to stop talking there. Otherwise, I'm going to start rambling. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully you have a chance to check out Pendragon. Again, I'm going to put some of these resources in a post of some kind. You'll probably find that link below. Uh, not right away, but eventually. Um, but thanks so much for listening and watching and I'll see you in the next video or the next stream.